Germany had their fearsome 88 mm guns, America had the 90 mm, and the Soviets had the 100 mm. The British had the 17 pounder, perhaps the best anti tank gun of the entire war. But where did it come from? What sort of performance did it have? And did it really cost 17 pounds? In this short video, I'll tell you all about Britain's big cat killer. We must first understand what came before. In 1935, Britain adopts the two pounder anti tank gun into service. The name simply meant that the shell it fired weighed two pounds, which is old artillery nomenclature. It was actually a 40mm gun. But it was clear even before the war started that the two pounder was going to be outclassed relatively soon with it only being able to penetrate 40 millimetres of armour at a thousand yards. In 1938, development began on a larger gun, a six pounder, 57 millimetres. It took the best part of four years to get this gun into service, and even before this had happened, concerns were raised. With the way German armour was increasing, even the new gun might struggle. So on May 15th, 1941, the Ordnance Committee began work on a gun that would be able to go through 150mm of armour at 730 metres. They chose a 76.2mm gun, 3 inch, that fired a shell that weighed 7.7 kilograms, or around 17 pounds. And if you're trying to save your pounds this Black Friday, sorry, that was um, embarrassing. I'll cut to the point, very short sponsor message incoming. Raycons are offering an insane deal this Black Friday which by my calculations is this time next week. You guys will be able to get a massive 30% off across their entire catalog. I've been using their everyday earbuds um, every day since they sent me a pair for the MIG vs Sabre video a couple of months ago and they're great. 32 hour battery life, multi-point connectivity and active noise cancelling. I've been traveling a lot recently with my nine to five job and they're great for a long flight, busy trains or annoying coworkers. The new quick charge feature allows 10 minutes of charge to give you 90 minutes of battery life and they include loads of different tips to make sure they'll fit comfortably even in weirdly shaped ears like mine. They're already an incredible deal but go to buyraycon.com forward slash rwf today to get up to 30% off site wide and help support the channel. You'll be annoyed you didn't get a pair sooner and if you don't love them for whatever reason there's a 30 day happiness guarantee. Cheers. But anyway, the 17 pounder. Two experimental guns were ready by September 1942. The Mark I was a towed anti-tank gun and the Mark II was for putting in tanks. Good thinking. And it was a good gun, launching 17 pound shells at 900 meters per second and slicing through 150 millimeters of armor at nearly a thousand meters. Incredibly impressive. That ought to give them something to think about. But there was a problem. They hadn't yet designed a carriage or a tank to put them into, and the three ton gun couldn't exactly be shoulder fired. However, the Nazis weren't about to wait for them, because in late 1942, in the Tunisian desert, British troops came up against Tigers for the first time. A solution was needed yesterday, and they sort of had one. The first 100 guns, at this point codenamed Pheasants, were mounted to the carriages of 25 pounder artillery pieces and dubbed the 17 25 pounder gun being rushed to North Africa for February 1943. And this gun was an absolute monster. It could punch clean through the 100mm frontal armour of a Tiger at distances of up to 2000 meters away, with it being accurate to about 20cm at a 1000m range. Its high muzzle velocity made it easy to lead moving targets and more forgiving to slight range miscalculations. However, the gun weighed 3 tonnes. It was incredibly difficult for a gun team to move it around and it's no accident that development of the vehicle mounted version started almost immediately. They just needed a vehicle to put it in. This was, for now, the A30 Challenger. So handsome. At this point in the war, the race was on to get 17 pounder equipped vehicles ready for the Normandy landings. The Challenger was not really on track and had a lot of issues so the British stuck the guns into American M10 tank destroyers and called them the 17 pounder SP Achilles. Nice. Work was also ongoing on putting it backwards into the Valentine, this one was the Archer. But as early as September 1943, there was a strange man in a shed working on sticking the massive 17 pounder gun into the turret of a Sherman. WGK Kilbourne, 
the Maniac in question first have to design an entirely new recoil system, as one meter recoil length was far too long. He also turned it onto its side to allow it to be loaded from the left. Obviously no space for a radio anymore, so that got shoved into an armoured box welded to the back. It wasn't balanced, so Kilburn simply designed a new barrel which had more weight towards the back. The single hatch on the roof would have been a problem, as all the turret crew would have had to struggle past the massive gun, so they just simply cut another one into the roof. They also removed the hull gunner to instead stick more 17 pound shells into his position. He'd done it. It was weird, awkward and hard to use, but it worked. The Sherman Firefly was born. Fireflies and Challengers would operate alongside regular Shermans and Cromwells in Europe, usually operating three 75mm armed tanks with one 17-pounder in each troop of four. The 17-pounders and the infantry capabilities were lacking, with lacklustre HE rounds and no hull machine gun, but luckily the 75mm were excellent at that job. As a priority target for enemy tanks, many Firefly crews tried to hide their gun barrels, leading to this iconic and eye-catching camo. In Normandy, Firefly and Challenger crews also got their hands on APDS rounds, discarding Sabos. If you've not seen my video on them, these fire smaller projectiles much faster, allowing them to defeat significantly more armour once they reach their targets. However, the Firefly couldn't hit anything with them. For some reason, the discarding of the Sabo pedals had a disastrous effect on accuracy with a 17 pounder. Yes, it could penetrate 230 mm of armour at 1000 metres, but could you get it on target? British documentation suggests you'd miss a Panther turret 50% of the time with APDS at only 400 yards away. At 600 yards, this falls to 33%. At 800 yards, it's 20%. The Americans fired 18 rounds at a 6 feet by 6 feet target at 1000 yards and failed to hit even one shot. Safe to say the tanks should close the distance to about 300 yards before firing at anything. The A-34 Comet entered service in December 1944, but contrary to popular belief, this tank is not armed with a 17 pounder gun. This is a weapon known as the 77mm High Velocity or HV. It used the same muzzle brake and fired the same projectiles, but used a much smaller casing to allow the gun to be significantly smaller and lighter, much more sensible. This gave the 77mm HV a muzzle velocity of around 800m a second instead of 900m a second, and the armour penetration decreased slightly as a result. However, whatever aerodynamic hijinks was going on with the 17 pounders Sabo shells did not extend to the 77mm HV's Sabos so it was a much more accurate gun when firing APDS. The 17-pounder went on to be mounted in the A43 Black Prince, which was rubbish, the Centurion Mark I and II, which were excellent, and the AC4, which was Australian, before being largely replaced in British service by the 20-pounder gun. In conclusion, the 17-pounder was a phenomenal artillery piece with incredible performance. It worked as a towed anti-tank gun if you didn't have to move it too often, and performed excellently as a tank gun, as long as you are willing to sacrifice ergonomics and anti-infantry performance. And of course, don't fire APDS until you can see the whites of their eyes. I hope you enjoyed this slightly shorter, slightly sillier video. Try to stay informative while allowing myself to have a little bit of fun. If you did enjoy, please do hit the like button and please consider subscribing, commenting down below if you have any ideas for future videos. As always, thank you so much to my Patreon members, and I'll see you guys in the next one.